Hey legends, and welcome back to the least knowledgeable sim racing channel, where we're staying true to our word. A few days ago, I promised you guys that I would buy and review Project Cars 3, just so that you wouldn't have to. So here we are, a few days later, with a deluxe edition of Project Cars 3, just to make sure I don't miss out on covering any of the glorious content for this super promising hardcore sim racer. The promotional material leading up to its release may have misled you guys, as it originally did me. Upon seeing the initial gameplay footage, I developed a misguided idea that this game would be appealing strictly to a casual, arcade racing audience. How wrong I was! With the assurance of the CEO of the company that this game would be all the sim we could want, followed by being informed that I was wrong to base my opinion on such a narrow demonstration of the game, I now have all the confidence in the world to review this game as what it truly is. A super hardcore, mega realistic sim racing game in disguise. Oh, you crafty buggers SMS, really pulled a quick one on us there. And here I was, worried that you would now be defrauding your customer base going on an entire decade by continually making promises that you don't fulfill, then making away with all the money while continuing to pump out rehashed, half-baked garbage to appeal to the few people that haven't already been burned by your shady marketing practices. But there you go. That shows me to never be presumptive and always take a developer at face value, because I might just look silly in the end. Before we get stuck into the review, some quick history to fill in the gaps for you guys who may not be familiar with the Project Cars series or Slightly Mad Studios. About a decade ago, Slightly Mad Studios got released from their contract with EA Games after finishing up work on Need for Speed Shift 2. After being liberated from one of the most controlling, toxic publishers in the gaming industry, they took their first free breaths in many years and immediately got to work planning their new franchise a grassroots franchise to be financed by the sim racer for the sim racer. They promised all manner of things from a groundbreaking approach to simulation through to endurance racing and all of the other things which gets us sim racers happy in the pants. Fast forward to the 6th of May 2015. After raising over $5 million via crowdfunding, the original Project Cars was finally released. It landed to a largely positive reception. While it may not have been quite the simulator which was promised, many fans were happy to take it as a sign of greater things to come. Come September 22nd, 2017, the eagerly anticipated sequel, Project Cars 2 comes out. During initial previewing, some people were underwhelmed by the relatively low quality of content planned for Project Cars 2. Because Project Cars straddled a bit of a middle ground, people used to playing strictly arcade and simcade races were a bit underwhelmed at the relatively low quantity of planned content. So, during the last few months to release, Slightly Mad doubled down and expanded the track and car list substantially. The drawback? Well, around 95% of the cars felt barely anything like they should, the track quality was hit and miss, and the feel of the game was never quite dialed in for either wheels or controllers. Small issues, to be sure. Most of us expected SMS to take their earnings and double down over the next couple of months, issuing the numerous bug fixes and physics adjustments their game required to match the expectations of the people who bought it. Being the professionals, however, they knew better than us. Instead, we got numerous monetized DLCs to add even more content to the rather colorful palette the game had established. Our minor concerns regarding force feedback the vast majority of cars feeling nowhere near correct, the curb behavior and overall physics being off were insignificant in the face of getting new content, which would help further compound and perpetuate these issues. So we're all happy to move on from there, content that SMS had done all they possibly could to ensure their customers got the best possible experience from their game. Coming off the second game, with now nearly a decade since the original crowdfunders had put down their money on the promise of a next generation sim racer, with both games having just marginally missed the mark, we all eagerly awaited the announcement of Project Cars 3. Upon seeing the initial teaser footage being shown, played with full assists on gamepad, many of us were a little mortified. Luckily, SMS soon followed that up with footage showcasing someone casually drifting around into Lagos. 
Combined with statements informing us that we shouldn't worry because this game is indeed still a full simulator, simply with a more accessible facade, we could all breathe easy once more. Perhaps after a decade, SMS could finally fulfill their promise to those crowdfunding backers which funneled multiple millions through the company over the years. With their recent acquisition by Codemasters, definitely not one of the most controlling or toxic publishers in sim racing, Slightly Mad could finally have the backing they need to execute their original vision. All of which brings us to today. After having invested 135 Australian dollars for the deluxe edition of this promising new sim racer, I couldn't wait to get stuck in and share the experience with you guys. What I can say is this. The game blew away all of my expectations and elevated not only the bar for sim racing physics to a place as yet unreached by the lowly, small budget developers most of us support, but also managed to make itself absurdly accessible by people from all walks of life. Something which regular, stuffy, po-faced, elitist sim racing has struggled to do since its inception. This game doesn't like to waste your time, so upon starting it, you're immediately greeted with a few prompts getting you to accept a biblical load of legal jargon, followed by their desire to collect data from your machine about how you play the game, assuredly to help continue elevating their revolutionary sim racing experience to new heights, and not at all for the purposes of pinpointing which new design concessions and DLC would bring the best ROI and fill out both their and their publishers' coffers. No, no, such things are the purview of bottom-line-oriented arcade racing developers and mobile studios, not hardcore racing purists like Slightly Mad Studios. The game doesn't mess around. After quickly designing your driver, it throws you straight into a GT race in the new Corvette C8R. I can't imagine a better way to debut the amazing C8R in sim racing than via this revolutionary new physics model. Now, because this game is a hardcore sim racer, I of course played it with my fanatic DD1, Hustingfeld Sprint Pedals, Thrustmaster TH8A Shifter, all on my sturdy, next level racing GT track. Now, I'm sure this is user error, but for some reason the game didn't prompt me to bind my controls before throwing me into this race. That is to say, I started the race without throttle, brake, clutch, or a shifter. But hey, that's just the way these things go. Do you think real life GT drivers get a chance to set up their car, go through weeks of setup and refinement work and actually plan for a race? Of course not. The team managers just throw them in there and hope for the best. That's why GT racing is so exciting. So after going through the menu to overcome the rookie mistake of not pre-cognitively binding my pedals through a menu I was never presented with, I restarted the race and was immediately back in action. Unfortunately for me and my rookie sensibilities, my default wheel rotation of 1080 degrees seemed to imply that I wanted the car to give me all of that steering range. Given that I was using a Fnatic Formula V2 rim, which generally struggles beyond 270 degrees of rotation per side, given that it's not actually an oval wheel, you can imagine I had quite the race. After being thoroughly decimated by the sheer brilliance of the next generation AI in Project Cars 3, I decided to double back and bind my controls to what I was used to. While I understand that making such concessions before racing is for the weakest among us, I had to acknowledge my inferiority at this point and accept that there was so much more that Project Cars 3 had yet to teach me. One of the things I realized during my introductory race is that Slightly Mad had absolutely nailed the feeling of driving cars at speed. Whether it be a high downforce GTE car or a four wheel drive road car, they love to completely brake traction any time the brakes are pressed down or the steering wheel input exceeds a given point, and you can quite easily correct for massive slip angle drifts while not losing any time. We finally have a developer which has taken the time to really nut down on the micro dynamics happening during driving to give us a properly engaging and realistic driving experience. A four-wheel drive road car has been my daily driver for going on a decade now, and the way they nailed the experience of it losing traction every single time I turned the wheel with absolutely no intrinsic understeer character or sense of stability was absolutely uncanny. I spend most of my time on the road counter-steering to correct for the massive rotation with my four-wheel drive road car, and I'm glad a developer has finally nailed that sensation in a sim. Moreover, Slightly Mad really know what gets the sim racers going. 
That's why the big focus for this game is to give us a curated single player campaign experience where we earn XP to unlock cars while listening to all sorts of impact sub drops to give us the dopamine hit we don't normally get from simply just having a compelling race on a good physics model. SMS know that the hardcore sim racer needs more than just that. After the introductory race is concluded, you're taken to the showroom, a magical place that stocks cars from all manufacturers in the game, including cars all the way from Toyota 86s all the way through to Formula and Indy cars. I'll have to look up where this place is because I wouldn't mind grabbing a Group C car as a weekender someday. The game then prompts you to purchase one of three Road E cars. While I can't say I've ever heard of this division, looking at the cars which qualify for it, I'm guessing I'd probably find it racing at the local track on most weekends. It should be said that a big part of the progression in this game is the aftermarket upgrade system. You need to keep your car competitive in order to progress. That's just as well, because your ability as a driver has very little to do with the outcome of a race, much like real life. Alongside this, SMS have understood our need to personalize our cars, so there's a substantial customization section where you can choose not only from a collection of pre-created liveries, but also stylize your car to your heart's content from the ground up. This is super important when you need to flex on people you beat online just right. Having a candy pearlescent Skyline R34 with license plates reading Simverge in 69 is far more potent than simply repping Falcon Motorsports or some such. Pushing through the virtual career in our own car adds a sense of weight and purpose to the experience. SMS have done away with the unnecessary parts of sim racing which get in the way of our fun, such as damage, so there's no consequence to driving around like a battering ram. This is super awesome because the AI in turn treat you the same way, so it's just as well that they've done away with trackside marshals, stopping our continual quest to turn every race into a destruction derby. I already feel like I'm learning so much about racecraft by watching these masterfully programmed drivers hold their lines and overtake so gracefully. One thing which they don't seem to have advertised, but I've stumbled upon all the same, and is a real testament to their humility, is that they appear to be using some sort of space age compound for the tyres. In spite of 10 hours of hard driving, I've not managed to overheat the tyres once, nor felt any drawback from starting cold and, heck, not been able to see a tyre temperature gauge anywhere. Under normal circumstances, I would think to myself, wow, this seems like a concession made solely for the casual gamer that wants a more arcade racing experience. But SMS have assured us that this is indeed a sim, so the only possible answer is that we're dealing with next generation rubber, unlike anything the world has ever seen before. I can't wait until other sims catch on and start using this forward looking new compound, especially since the clear way of getting ultimate lap times is by quasi drifting every corner. This ties in wonderfully to Project Car's industry leading weather system. When Project Cars 2 first came out, it was generally accepted that no other game rendered wet weather driving as well. Simulating everything from drying lines to standing bodies of water dynamically generated based on track geometry, the game provided a next level wet weather racing experience. Project Cars 3 takes this to the logical next step, making every road feel like an ice skating rink the moment some water touches it. It's amazing that we're loaded up with this space-age tyre compound because given this amount of drifting, our regular, plebby, modern-day tyres would burn up in just about one or two laps. Speaking of which, it's quite rare to find a race which lasts for more than a handful of laps. It seems like SMS have really dialed in towards sprint racing. I can't wait to get further into the career and do some longer endurance racing with pit stops. That is, once I work out how to get into the pit lane. Gee, there I go with being an amateur again. Let's touch back on the foundation and real crowning jewel of this game, its revolutionary handling model. Along with SMS nailing all the nuances of real racing, such as race strategy, 
traction slipping during cornering, and the overall sense of consequence, what they've really done is highlighted how deadly and unusable curbs are. Everybody knows real racing drivers stay away from curbs like the plague, and Project Cars 3 really gives you a sense for this, because every time you get a tire on one, you can bet that it will start to shoot your car out all over the place. It's really the attention to detail that allows this title to shine. A regular developer might just look at their Space Age tire compound and say, heck, we have these magic tires, why don't we just can in some code to give us rail-like grip under all conditions? Not SMS though, they're making sure all the dynamics of racing are presented exactly as you would want. Much like Project Cars 2 before it, Project Cars 3 brings in a ton of content. In fact, now that I think about it, it's almost like the majority of the content from the last game has been ported straight into the new. Under regular circumstances, I would write that off as lazy game development, but not with SMS. We know that all the tweaking done under the hood to refine their revolutionary physics model takes a gargantuan amount of man hours. They did this for us, the fans, to give us the most realistic driving experience which was promised nigh on 10 years ago. Besides, it's not like they'd straight port the same tracks and cars with barely any change in presentation whatsoever. The number crunching from Project Cars 3's next generation physics model really takes its toll because even despite looking like a mobile game at times, it managed to slow down quite regularly on my GTX 1080 Ti. You've got to hand it to developers like SMS, who value the integrity of the racing experience enough to compromise the end user experience just to ensure greater realism under the hood. If only we got more of this with developers such as Kunoz and Studio 397. The game is vibrant, colourful and highly contrasted, just like the real world. The graphics are in no way a straight port from Project Cars 2, with slightly adjusted colour grading to pass them off as something new. No. No, you can quite clearly tell that these models have been meticulously recreated and warrant being packaged as a brand new game rather than simply a set of additions to a prequel which could just as well have been supported for a few more years. The sounds are a tremendous improvement over Project Cars 2. Instead of cars sounding like your rear is right next to the manifold with all the distortion and overprocessing that would imply, they now instead sound muted and sterile, just like modern cars should. My favourite is the external camera sounds, which really capture the weight of engines, sounding like a thin, modulating synthesizer from the 90s. These sounds are wonderfully supported by all the licensed music offered by this title. No longer is music simply confined to menus, oh no, you're encouraged to listen to it throughout the race, because after all, what use is being able to hear the rev range at which you should change gears when you can instead enjoy your favourite bass drops? Everybody knows that real life racing drivers have one earbud blasting sick beats while the other one feeds the race engineer to them, just like Project Cars 3. This is the first sim which has truly captured this critical aspect of racing. Because this game was still in early access at the time of making this video, we unfortunately couldn't delve into multiplayer games, so instead we'll move straight on to the summary and do our best to encapsulate all the ways in which Project Cars 3 raises the bar for hardcore racing simulation. Gosh, it's tough to know where to start. Looking at all the developments that Project Cars 3 brings can be deceptive to the untrained eye. A layman might look at the game and say, hey, this is clearly just a rehash of Project Cars 2 with neutered handling and a progression system plastered on top to make a quick cash grab. Luckily, we took a moment to catch our breath, listen to the developers, and as hardcore sim racers, actually play the game before casting judgement. SMS assured us that Project Cars 3 would indeed remain a sim. And boy did they deliver. Not only do we get a revolutionary handling model, finally showcasing how time efficient drifting most corners can be, a space age tyre compound which never cools, warms, or wears out, cars which run on fuel that's so efficient that burning through it never even becomes a consideration in a race, AI that doesn't bother with trivial minutiae such as race strategy or player awareness, pit lanes which never distract us by actually opening, and cars that are so reinforced and safe that performance impacting damage is a thing of the past. 
It's hard to know what to praise more, the next generation true to life car handling or the vague, uninformative force feedback model perfectly emulating the feeling of modern power steering. Perhaps the graphics, which somehow have managed to stay nearly identical to Project Cars 2, yet with worse performance, surely to account for the gargantuan amount of number crunching going on under the hood. Whatever the case, SMS have really brought the goods this time. After 10 years, they finally fulfilled their initial promise of delivering all the realism and engagement we could want. Bless you, SMS. You are Atlas, holding the sim racing world atop your shoulders. Without your leadership and path-paving prowess, our little niche industry simply couldn't exist. Be sure to hit that sub and ring the bell to catch all future impartial, honest, and hyper-serious sim racing reviews on this channel. I appreciate you guys joining me for this landmark moment in sim racing history. Until next time, we'll see you later.